we're inviting you to kind of think about these two questions and then adding a sticky note to our Jamboard. The first one being, what is one word your students or your learners would use to describe math? what something maybe you've heard or something that comes to mind. And then the next one is a word that your students would use to describe nature or the environment. And so we'll give you a few moments to add those sticky notes in. And if we just check out the next slide here, if you are new to Jamboard, um, you can follow where the purple arrow is pointing there to create a new sticky note for connecting and adding your words. And then up at the top, you'll notice that there's a little arrow next to this green arrow um, where you can move to the next screen to answer that second question. So we would really love to hear both that word for describing math and that word for describing nature. And we're going to come back and see your answers in just a few minutes after we kick things off for our program today. All right, for those who are just joining us and those who were patiently waiting in the waiting room, welcome. It is July 20th. I can't believe it's, well, it, can we say summer's half over? No, it's 40% over. How dare I say such a thing? It's a beautiful hot day where I am based in Southern Ontario. My name is Ian Shanahan. I'm representing Green Teacher, who is hosting this fine event, Math Plus Nature Equals Fun, which is being presented by staff from CyberChase and Project Learning Tree. So we've already given you instructions, but if you did miss this, Danica just mentioned to rename yourself first and last name. If you'd like to add your pronouns, please feel free to do that as well. Let us know you're joining us, where you are joining us from, and I hope you are filling in your answers on the Jamboard. What words come to mind when you think about nature and what words come to mind when you think about math? I'm going to- And if I'll any of you, sorry, if any of you are having trouble with the Jamboard, feel free to just put your response in the chat and we'll add it to the Jamboard. Just let us know if it's a word to describe math or a word to describe nature. So let's take a look at the Jamboard and see what we have. But before we do that, I'm going to pass the virtual baton back to Danica for our territorial acknowledgement. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Ian. So again, hello, everyone. I'm Danica Strecco, and I am so grateful to be joining you from the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people in Vancouver, British Columbia. It's a beautiful afternoon and it always is a great reminder to me the importance of that reciprocal relationship with looking after the land so the land can continue to look after us um, and bringing that into all of our work, engaging young learners in those environmental experiences. And so as a way to recognize um, where you're all joining us from, we definitely like to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat um, with whose land you are on. Um, and if you are still learning, as many of us are, um, we'll add a link to native-land.ca to actually learn about the land that you are on. And you can always check that out. And um, maybe you're joining us from somewhere new or this is early on in your learning experience. And I'd like to turn it over to Janice as well to say hello. Hi everyone, I'm Janice Fold. I work at the WNE2 group. We're the group that makes the show Cyber Chase. And I want to acknowledge and pay deep respect to the Lenape people upon whose unceded and ancestral homeland lies New York City. And, and like Danica said, please uh, add your territorial acknowledgements to the chat as well. Pass the mic back over to you, Danica. Wonderful. And so with kind of the, mm -hmm. the introduction to our program today, I'm hoping that we will see many of you um, adding to the Jamboard and sharing that in the chat. All right, well, let's take a look at the Jamboard itself. I'm just going to share the Jamboard so that we can all see the responses on it. Wonderful. And the great thing about the Jamboard is it is live. So even as we're kind of taking a first look at what we have there, then we can continue, um, we can continue to add to it as we check that out. We just want to kind of take a couple of first impressions, see 
what you're bringing with you and your student experiences with math and nature. All right, almost ready here with the screen share. I always find word association is a very fun activity and very revealing. Well, let's see what this reveals. <laughs> yes, okay, <Yuck>. fantastic. <laughs> Torture. Um, so seeing again, kind of some themes there, hard, tricky, you know, boring. I do love that we also have magical and fun on there. I think it's great to have a little bit of both, but I know definitely even growing up and thinking back on my student experience that um, definitely kind of hard or difficult, frustrating was a lot of terms um, that came to mind there. And then if we head over to our, our next page to see some of the words describing nature, Buggy. And that's really interesting. Yeah, buggy, scary. Maybe we're getting some more of those kind of summer uh, connections going as we see lots of bugs popping up there. Um, but definitely relaxing or interesting um, comes to mind as well. And so we really do want to think about how we can kind of merge the elements of these two different pieces, bringing some of that kind of positive curiosity, that connection to fun or relaxing um, back to kind of math. And when we think about whether, you know, we find that challenging and new ways to engage learners, as we definitely know that, you know, math and other STEM skills are so important. We want to engage learners and reduce some of those barriers or any of that hesitancy to engaging in that. And that's what we're really excited to talk to you about today. Excellent. Well, now that we've broken the ice, I'm just going to let you know a little bit about your host organization, Green Teacher. Just quickly before we do that, though, I would like to introduce the four folks who will be presenting. So we have Anna Lerner, who's doing a lot of the important work behind the scenes. She'll be sharing a lot in the chat box. She's joining us from Project Learning Tree based in the United States. In Canada, also with Project Learning Tree, you've already heard from her, Dana Castreco. You've already heard from Janice Folds, who is based in New York City and is representing CyberChase. And we haven't heard from yet, but we will soon, and we'll be seeing a fun demo, is Janelyn Mays based in New Mexico. She is also representing CyberChase. So Green Teacher is a nonprofit organization that has existed for over three decades. Our mission is to enhance environmental literacy among young learners. And we do this by equipping educators with evidence-based, relevant, and innovative resources. Our vision is to ensure that each successive generation of young learners is more environmentally literate than the last. How do we ach achieve all of this? We have our quarterly magazine and resource portal, which is subscriber-based. We have a number of nonprofit books, including our two most recent books, Teaching Kids About Climate Change and Teaching Teens About Climate Change. We also have a podcast, Talking with Green Teachers, you can find, and I'm gonna use that pretentious phrase, wherever you get your podcasts because you can get it wherever you get your podcasts. It is literally true. And we just put up an episode about managing eco-anxiety and ecological grief, which has been getting a lot of attention since it went up a few days ago. I would just like to take this moment before we jump back in and I pass the virtual baton back to Danica to thank our webinar partners for sharing and spreading the word about this fine event and part one of this event, which happened on June 29th. So thank you to these fellow environmental education organizations, both in Canada and in the United States, especially in the US, a lot of affiliates with the North American Association of Environmental Education. So thank you all for spreading the word and thank you all participants for being here today. Back to Danica. Awesome, thanks so much, Ian. And so to start off our program today, I'd like to just take a quick look at outcomes as they are essential to measure and chart success. And we do our best to identify and deliver on them in all aspects of our work. So this session will be a success when you feel confident to do the following two things using PLT and Green It Up, engaging hands-on activities and educational media to strengthen kids' mathematics and other 
STEM skills, as well as using the outdoors to create a fun, authentic learning experience for kids ages five to eight. And next, we'll just take a quick look at our agenda. It's a great way to kind of have um, a rough idea of how the next 50 minutes together are going to look. And really, we want to focus on, you know, why we would, why using nature to teach math and really to teach anything um, is so important in engaging learners and ways that we can use nature for teaching, categorizing and graphing. We really encourage you to stay right to the end of today's program for a great list of tips for teaching outdoors in general. And we invite you to share and engage all throughout the program in the chat as we will also have a, a live Q&A at the end. So hold on to those burning questions until then. And we'd love for you to then use that raise hand function and come on mic or camera and share your questions or even some of your lessons learned. Just as a quick reminder, this is an interactive session. Um, we are hoping to do um, some hands-on activities with you. If you collected seeds ahead of time or if you have a pencil and paper handy, that will be awesome to engage with you as we do some of these activities together. And so heading right into nature and math and the benefits of using nature to teach math. Um, we'll actually skip right on to the next slide and really think about how nature is innately fascinating context for learning math concepts. Math helps us to understand the natural world around us and can inspire new mathematical ideas. So these are just a few benefits for using nature and the environment to teach math. And we want to encourage you to, you know, keep these tips in mind as we explore the activities and demos that we're gonna to feature today, as well as take any opportunity to share in the chat if some of these look familiar or if you have new ones that you'd like to share and add. And so one of my favorites is really the idea that it provides motivation and makes math meaningful. Using math in real life context helps learners see how and why it is important in their everyday lives and helps to move math learning from the abstract to the concrete. It supports diversity. The outdoors offers an infinite variety of pathways and materials for learning math skills and concepts, some of which we're gonna to explore today. This diverse context is beneficial for diversity of learners with a wide range of social, emotional, physical, cognitive, and cultural needs. It also enhances cross-curricular learning, Doing math activities outside or in nature, children not only develop math skills and can meet academic standards, but can also better understand science and social studies concepts and strengthen their language proficiency and other STEM skills. This promotes life skills. Exploring math outside in the real world helps learners develop those life skills such as gardening or service learning or using a compass. And it's an excellent way to support child development. Fresh air and sunlight are important for children's health and well being. Outdoor learning can improve learners' attention skills, elevate mood, and provide opportunities for physical development. It really helps improve overall school success, where you can see an improvement in learners' test scores, attendance, and overall attitudes. So, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really kind of excited to see some of those great suggestions in the chat. We always love to hear from you. And did some of these resonate? Do you have other experiences or benefits that you would like to share? And so a little bit about Project Learning Tree and how we connect these benefits in our programs and resources is that Project Learning Tree is available through our network of partners across the US and internationally, including resources specific to Canadian audiences. In 2020 alone, PLT has reached 2.3 million students and trained nearly 8,000 educators to help students learn how to think, not what to think about complex environmental issues. And through its supported curriculum materials and professional development opportunities, PLT uses trees and forests as windows on the world, supporting academic standards and advancing environmental literacy, stewardship, and career pathways for ages one, through 18 and beyond. 
So thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to Janice to introduce CyberChase. Thanks, Danica. Hi, everyone. I'm Janice Fold from the CyberChase team. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about CyberChase. Um, so it's America's longest running kids math series. And I'm just curious um, how many people in the audience have watched CyberChase or used CyberChase resources. I'd love to um, just see a show of hands or just right in the chat. Okay, we have, oh, I see someone loves the show. Great. Um, so basically it features a team of curious kids who are summoned into cyberspace to outwit and outsmart the villain hacker. I don't know if you can see I'm wearing him on my shirt there, hacker, um, using math and problem solving skills. So these are heroes, but they don't have any other powers other than their math skills and their problem solving skills. And um, the show was initially created to really help kids know that math is everywhere and to destigmatize it and let kids know that math can be fun and it's something that all kids can be successful in um, and as the series has evolved the 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 topics have expanded and now we have a very strong focus on math as well as the environment and all of the episodes show kids using problem solving skills and math to help so explore the environment and solve different problems they encounter let's go to the next slide So for CyberChase, we've created this program we started last year called Green It Up. And the whole goal of Green It Up is to inspire an appreciation for nature, build STEM skills, and help kids feel empowered to make a positive impact in, on the environment in their own way through recycling, composting, helping people be aware of different things that they can do to make a difference. And we've been working this year with 10 PBS stations around the country. They are all listed here, Arizona PBS, Detroit PBS, Georgia Public Broadcasting, KLRN in San Antonio, PBS Western Reserve, Valley PBS, West Tennessee PBS, WFSU, WPBS, and WXXI. If any of you are from those regions, let us know, we'll give you a shout out. And basically each of these stations are working with local organizations to plan and implement six to 13 week sessions. And all of the programs end with a fun big finale where kids get to create their own PSAs, like their own videos or posters talking about um, an environmental issue that they learned about during the program. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we have a whole suite of activities that are available free and online, and you guys can check it out right after this workshop. There, it's all available at this website here, and um, Anna just put the link in the chat there. Um, this is our Green It Up website, and we have activity cards, which have different fun activities. We're, uh, my colleague, Jana Lynn, is going to demonstrate one in just a few minutes. Um, we have a Kids Can Help checklist, which lists different kid-friendly actions where kids can help out in the environment. Um, we have a a bilingual family booklet. Again, that's free and downloadable from the website. And um, we have a suite of educational resources on PBS Learning Media. And all of the materials we create are use video and media as a springboard. Um, and right now, I'm going to show you an example of that is we are going, Janeline is going to demonstrate a lesson on pollinators. But before we do that, I just want to show you a little uh, segment about pollinators. Now, just to give you some background, um, we have our character Digit and his cousin, cousin Bridget, Bridget and Digit, um, has a beautiful garden and she has these cactus apple flowers. But there's a problem. Um, normally bats come and they pollinate the flowers and the flowers get converted into cactus apples, but there are no bats. So she's very stressed out because she can't make her famous Cax's apple juice. So she starts talking about pollination and the characters are like, what are you talking about? So here she's explaining to them what pollination is and the importance of bats. So Ian, See? let's roll it. Hungry bats come to my garden to drink the nectar from my apple cactus flower. Hey, is this going to happen all day, Nezzy? Maybe. And don't call me Nezzy. <laughs> when they drink, they get pollen from the flowers on themselves. They don't mean to, but they do. That's the gold dusty stuff. Then they carry the pollen from one flower to another. That's pollination. Bats are so cool. Thanks, Ian. Not looking. <laughs> now this is part of a clip that you can find on the Green It Up page. And um, you can also watch the whole episode, which I encourage you to do. Um, and Nora just posted in the chat a link to our PBS Learning Media um, 
Cyber Chase collection, which has a whole suite of Cyber Chase lessons and activities and videos. Um, and for Green It Up, we have these uh, pollinator activity, which comes with these different activity cards, as well as in our activity booklet, a related um, activity on pollination, which you can see here. But rather than us talking about it and telling you about it, I'm going to invite Jana Lynn to the stage, who is a dynamic teacher from New Mexico, who has been introducing kids all around uh, Albuquerque to uh, green it up and is going to demonstrate this pollinator activity. So Jana Lynn, come to the stage. Hello. Hi, everyone. I hope every, all you teachers are enjoying your spring or your summer break and it's not going by too fast. Um, and I want to go back to PBS Learning Media real quick. Cyber Chase, wonderful. But there's so much more. If you don't have an account on um, PBS Learning Media, please go and set an account up. They have wonderful free lessons on any subject for almost every grade. You put in the subject and up pops lesson plans, activities, videos. So that's my um, plug for PBS Learning Media because it is a wonderful uh, resource, for free resource for teachers. And you will find all of the Cyber Chase stuff on that, uh, on that um, website as well. It's easier if you use the link, but um, I am not as polished as the others. I, I am a teacher. I really am. I taught pre-K this last year. I'm starting my 30th year this year. Going to be a reading interventionist, but I'm going to do a gardening club so I can keep doing Cyber Chase, green it up because I, it's a wonderful program. And so the, all of the lessons in Cyber Chase, there's 13 of them, start off with that video clip. So it kind of gets the kids hooked into it because they love it just like we do. They're like, oh, I've watched that. But then, um, then you lead on, you lead into, and they have all of it very readily available, listed what you're going to need, what the big idea is. And the big idea on this lesson is pollination. And uh, so we watched the bats, you know, the clips, and then we went outside and we looked for pollinators. And then we came back and we went on a nature walk. And then we came back to class and made a list of all the pollinators that we saw. We did not see any bats, but we saw, you know, ladybugs and butterflies and bees. And so we made that list. And then we actually got to talk about what does pollination mean? Like what? And we decided then the kids got to pick what pollinator they wanted to be. So they were pollinators. And I, and th th this is part of the lesson, you know, sets up flowers around the classroom or if you want to do it outside. And I made several different colors. It's dyed sugar, um, not too hard to make, um, and little bitty baby pom-poms of the same color, which I got off of Amazon for less than $10 and the kid-friendly tweezers. So you could get all the supplies for this for less than $20. Um, Amazon, Lakeshore, Lakeshore is gonna be a little more expensive, but the kid-friendly tweezers are nice, they're plastic, and the kids were very excited to be a pollinator and I sat them around and I had two of each color because you don't want them all at one. And we did set a timer for a minute and then they set off with their empty cup and their tweezers and they went around and collected different colors of pom-poms and they collected them into their little uh, cup and went around for a minute and they were running around squealing they have a great time i've done it several times so and trust me once you do it once they'll want to do it again <laughs> because they do like to do it so they go around and they collect all the pollen because they're collecting pollen uh, or nectar from the different flowers and then when the timer goes off you come back you gather up and they check out theirs and then you and then you it works best the lighter sugar color so the yellow you can honestly see that there's different colors of sugar in there so this flower got pollinated and the kids could literally oh that's how yes it was stuck on the pom-pom it was stuck on your you know your uh, tweezers and so when you went around you pollinated these flowers and um, so the, it was highly engaging and they love it. And so um, after that, we counted to include 
some math, we um, counted how many pom-poms they got in a minute. And some kids got a lot because they were very fast and had better fine motor skills than others. Um, some only got two or three. I think there's a picture of, of I made a graph of it. We graphed it then of how many uh, flowers we got to go to and then compared and talked about why some flowers or I mean, some pollinators were faster than others, just like maybe in nature, maybe a bee isn't as fast as a hummingbird, so forth. So we did that, but tied the math into it with the graph and counting all the pom poms. And um, I was sure to really uh, make sure that they understand that this, that the sugar that was mixed in the, each flower meant that that flower or that plant was pollinated. Uh, can I get a, can I get the slide with the graph on it? I think that would help um, explain, show what I did. Let's see. I mean, I have the graph somewhere. Oh, there's my little guy. Yes. He, lo they loved it there. How many flowers did you visit? And so we made a graph so we could compare. We talked about how did, you know, number eight get that many versus how many number nine, uh, they were slow and wasn't as fast. They had a harder time with the fine motor skills, but um, it was a great way to incorporate math and the nature into it. Um, and so then, trust me, they'll ask you to do this one again and again. Then I extended the lesson. They got to use their pom-poms and I added some more pom-poms. I opened it up to um, branch out into a art activity. And I believe there's a Thing about that one as well. Yes, yeah, so they then made flowers out of their pom-poms and added pollinators. I love the hummingbird um, and the butterfly. Um, and so then we, they had big, poly yeah, I added big pom-poms. I just let them have at it. So it was an all morning activity. It was a nature walk. It was counting how many pollinators we saw on our nature walk. It, then it extended into graphing and then art. And there, there's many others in this uh, cyber chase thing. And one of the other ones that really incorporates um, math is the food miles. And it talks about how, as um, wh where does food come from? So we, and th so that that's a whole lesson about where does food come from? And there is a video clip. And they get very excited to tell you, you know, that the milk comes from the grocery store. And then you get that opens up for that conversation. Where does it, how does it get to the grocery store? And so the game, there is a game that comes with this um, program called Food Miles. And they have to get a blue one, a green card, and a yellow card. And then they have to add up how many miles. And the the point of this is that actually the one with the least amount of miles wins because we want to use less resources, less gas. We want to shop local from local farmers so as to not add to pollution and whatnot. So that is a very fun program that kids truly enjoyed. And not just this lesson, all of the lessons. There was more on deforestation. Um, there's yeah, there's 13 different ones. And so it is a wonderful resource. I highly recommend it because uh, it gets them engaged and they have so much fun. If there's any questions, please let me know. You know, let me know because um, I might have forgotten something. Natalie, you're, you're getting a lot of love in the chat. Um, oh, Earl but, says, you know, I, uh, wait, I just lost her message, but I love the um, pom-pom pollination. Yes. Um, brilliant. I will definitely implement it. Yes, and then I would love to take credit for this, but I did not. This is Cyber Chase. Um, and so, and, but it does really work. It makes adults are like, oh, I mean, you really see how it works. So, um, but in actually, general- Actually, Nora Jones, who is in the, in the room also, oh, she created this activity and she's, oh, she's with us today. Thank you so much, Nora. It is a wonderfully engaging um, activity that kids all ages, I did it with, I've done it with kindergarten up to fifth grade. The fifth graders loved it as much as the kindergartners did. They had better, um, I, now this summer, that graph was from kindergartners because the fifth graders, they were much better. They were grabbing like clumps of pom-poms. <laughs> but so um, I hope I explained it and didn't talk too fast. Oh, well, thanks, Janelyn. And I just want to give a shout out to Janelyn because I think 
you've done such a nice job of integrating math in just a seamless way into the activity and just a fun and engaging manner with the math and the art. And, and I think your kids, they, they probably, while they're doing it, don't realize like necessarily this is math, this is they science, don't. this yeah. is art. Yeah. They don't. They just know that they're having fun and learning about nature, which like we said, the, the math part, sometimes they don't like math, but they sure do like nature. And when you put it together, they, uh, they learn and they enjoyed it. So that's great. Well, thanks, Janelyn. And speaking of nature, let's pass the mic back over to Danica, who's going to take us on a fun seed adventure. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Janelyn. It was really great to see those wonderful examples of describing, measuring, and comparing those attributes of objects and connecting it to where our food comes from. And so I will be introducing a PLT activity that continues to build on graphing and categorizing skills related to seeds and how they are dispersed. And so to get us kind of warmed up thinking about seeds, I'd love to see in the chat, what are seeds and what do they do? Kind of how, what is your impression of seeds? And what are some ways that come to mind for how you might categorize them? And so if you did have an opportunity to collect some seeds to bring with you, it's great to take a look at what might be in front of you, or even just to think back to um, seeds that maybe you've come across in the past few months, whether it's in your kitchen pantry or out on a walk, and kind of what some of those characteristics that could help you categorize them might be. Awesome. So please definitely share them in the chat with myself and Anna, and we'd love to see them coming in. And so, Today's activity is from PLT's Explore Your Environment K-8 Activity Guide, and it's called Have Seeds Will Travel. And so the guide itself has over 50 activities and tips for teaching outside. And this activity in particular explores trees and seeds and then builds on those categorizing and graphing with natural objects. And so a quick introduction to seeds is a seed is a small, hard part of a flowering plant from which a new plant can grow. Each plant needs a certain amount of sunlight, air, water, and nutrients from the soil for its seed to germinate and grow into a mature plant. If a seed simply drops from the parent plant and tries to grow in its shadow, it might compete with the parent for those essentials. So most seed bearing plants have developed a way to disperse seeds away from the parent, giving the new plants a better chance to find what they need to grow. Some pretty cool plant parenting. And so I really love to kind of show this video as a hook from the Smithsonian Channel because plants have some pretty spectacular ways of dispersing their seeds and can invite inquiry and dispersal uh, and inquiry into those dispersal mechanisms. So let's take a look at this Smithsonian Channel video um, and see how these seeds are being dispersed. Violet flower seeds are crammed into a special pod. As the pod dries out, the pressure is intense. Eventually, something's got to give. Touch-me-nots are even more highly sprung. The slightest... <laughs> Perfect. So that one was really exciting for me to see. I didn't even know that that was a dispersal mechanism of seeds before I saw this video. And hopefully we can share the link in the chat with you so that if you'd like to use it for a hook with your learners as well, it's a great way to get started. And so definitely I love seeing your suggestions, different categories, so size, shape, color, and those different dispersal methods. So thank you, Michelle, for sharing, you know, air, water, or animal transportation. And so to get us kind of warmed up with thinking about those different dispersal categories of seeds, I want to share with you a few maybe unusual seeds or maybe very common ones, depending on where you're joining us from. And we're going to kind of play a little game using a chatterfall. And so if you're new to using a chatterfall on Zoom, 
you type your answer into the chat, but you don't hit send until I say one, two, three, go. And so that allows all of the answers to come into the chat all at once. And it's a really kind of fun way to see how we can give categorizing a try. So our first seed is the coconut. And you can take a look at those four example dispersal methods in the corner of the screen. You can type your answer in the chat, but don't hit send just yet. Hopefully once You've got one of those four types in, whether you think the coconut floats on water, bounces or rolls, is stored by animals or floats on air. And all right, let's see what you think. I'll say one, two, three, and go. And love it. Oh, I absolutely love seeing just that chatter fall of answers coming in. And absolutely, you know, we could definitely see that bouncing or rolling. But if we head to the next slide, actually the most common form of dispersal is floats on water. Those coconut trees need really a lot of space to spread out. And so they can travel quite a long distance that way. So our next one is a, the dandelion. Oh, we <laughs> kind of, if you maybe saw the answer there, but we'll, we'll try a quick one anyway. Select which way you think that dandelion seed is dispersed. And once you have it in the chat there, I'll say one, two, three, and go. And let's see what you're thinking for those daddy lines. Oh, perfect. Yes, resounding floats on air. You can even see those seeds making their way off the flower in the picture. And so for the final bonus round, we'll take a look at the pecan on the next slide. And so we have a couple of options left to think about. You can type it in the chat how do you think those pecans um, get dispersed and so hopefully you had a chance to add it in there and then i'll give it our final one two three go how do we think those pecans move nice so we got quite a good flow in there and definitely you know we might think stored by animals they're a pretty tasty seed um, but if we just go to our final slide here Actually, their most common form of dispersal is that nice, hard, tough shell that helps it bounce or roll away from the parent tree. So thank you so much for joining me in that activity, kind of starting to think about those different categories of seeds. And I would love to just kind of share some of the other categories that we use in this activity and can be used in a variety of different ways. So heading to our next slide, we have, you know, that floats or flies in air. And I'd love for you to take a moment, whether it's looking at the seeds in front of you or thinking to back to some seeds or sharing in the chat, what are some or, sorry, characteristics that help categorize them between floating on air or flying in air? What do you notice between those um, cottonwood or cattail or maple seeds, how that kind of changes how they get dispersed. And then heading to our next slide, we also have that eaten or stored by animals category with our cherry, our peach. Again, thinking what are some of those characteristics of those seeds that make them so good at that dispersal or well kind of um, identified as that dispersal method? And then next up are six to animals. Definitely a common one, whether you've been out for a walk and you find these kinds of seeds on your pant leg or in your dog's fur. What are, again, some of those features? What would you look for in the body of the seed that makes them so good at sticking to animals? And then lastly, we have our released or opened by fire, the lodgepole pine, jack pine. And again, these ones might be harder to identify by sight looking for some of those different characteristics. But they're such a cool dispersal method with, um, you know, one forest management practice actually promotes regrowth and reproduction using these categories of seeds and tree species with prescribed burning, the planned application of fire with the intent to confine the burning to a predetermined area. So these seeds actually only open and release 
when there is enough fire or heat present. All right, so great to again, think of some of those different characteristics that we're gonna be looking for. We'll head to our next slide where it features the student page from Have Seeds Will Travel. And this is a free download if you head over to plt.org and sign up for an account. Um, but don't worry, you don't have to have one printed out with you today. You can also have a pencil and paper to sketch a quick graph. So I'm going to head over to sharing my screen and sharing a few of the seeds that I've collected in the neighborhood um, and showing you how we can categorize and graph these seeds. All right, perfect. So hopefully we can see those. And what I love about these seeds is again, thinking about different things that you can look for. So I have some of these ones that have different burrs. They're very easy to kind of stick to one another or move around and kind of, you can see all those different features that might help it stick to the fur of an animal. We also have seeds that I really kind of like to recognize as that um, floats on air with these different kind of winged features that you often see them kind of spiraling down out of trees. And lastly, these kind of neat looking ones that actually came off of a seeding kale plant. So great for that category of eaten or digested by animals. And so if you have seeds with you today, I would love for you to share in the chat how you might categorize the ones you have or what some of those characteristics that might you might encourage your learners to look for if you're out on a walk collecting seeds. Um, and of course, different ones are going to show up at different times of year. And so as I mentioned, we have our student page here that can, oops, let's just zoom back out, um, that actually sets you up with a great template for the number of seeds that you can find, as well as the categories. It gives you three spaces for categories to add in and start either working individually or in small groups or even as an entire class. As you saw, Janelyn had that great kind of poster chart for her class work. And so again, if you don't have the student sheet printed or you want to design your own, it's really easy to just map out those categories. So we have the three from the seeds that I took a look at. And what I love about kind of making a bigger version of this chart too, is that you can actually sort your seeds directly in and even kind of help count those seeds out and manipulate them move them around the page as you go. Looks like I have a few extras with me today. So you can definitely total them all up and see how many you have in each category. And again, you can do this as a class or you could even do this individually depending on how your learners are exploring and getting hands on with the seeds that they've collected. And once you've managed to map out that graph, you can even, you know, take your pen and mark it on the graph. So here, I think I used orange for our six to animals. You can draw that out and shade in your bar graph. You can kind of move those seeds to the side. And I always love to have a version so you can actually visualize how that would turn out. And you can talk about why you maybe found different kinds of seeds in different quantities as you go. So in a pretty short amount of time, you can get outside, you can collect seeds with your students, and you can work on that classification of seeds into deciding what category characteristics fit into what categories, but and then apply that interpretation of a data using classification. You can create a bar graph based on those chosen categories individually or as a group transitioning from primary data to secondary data. And you can use nature to 
learn mathematical literacy and really get hands on with that connection to how math is in their natural environment. And so I hope you had a chance to kind of take a look at seeds or even think of some categories that you might use and do that activity along with me. And that's a really great way to kind of look at math concepts in a natural fashion instead of that kind of lecture based method. And so I always like to connect back to, you know, how we can use the core competencies and common core concepts in all of these activities. So seeds are a great natural object for this activity because of their diversity and availability. And you can really kind of get hands on with that learning opportunity. But it hits all of these common core concepts as well, that you know objects have attributes that can be described, measured, and compared, or that you can then use standard units to describe and measure and compare attributes between these different objects and shapes. I always love hearing in the chat too that of course, in addition to seeds, many different types of natural objects could be collected and used for this activity. You might even vary them seasonally. So spring is sometimes a great time to find seeds. I noticed that even the couple of weeks since our last presentation, you know, it was things had changed outside. So it's a way of monitoring what's happening in the local environment. You could use fallen leaves, rocks, or sticks. So please, I welcome in the chat you sharing if you have kind of some ideas of what natural objects you might want to find locally and you could use for this activity. And it really kind of helps you connect to your location, your setting. Um, one of the extension activities in this lesson even includes a craft using different art materials like feathers or toothpicks or cardboard to then go through the design thinking process and kind of prototype a new type of seed and thinking what those characteristics might be for a seed that your students design. And so I really love this activity as we take a look at the next slide and how it connects to the green it up migration topic. And so as mentioned, you know, this activity is from PLC's Explore Your Environment K-8 Activity Guide. And we have a free version for families to explore available in English and Spanish on PLT's website. But one of the reasons why we love sharing these activities together with Cyber Chase and Green It Up is that it really shows that collaboration and how PLT and Green It Up um, make STEM focused connections between PLC activities, Cyber Chase activity cards, and those explore and get outside activities that are listed. And so now I really hope that, you know, thinking back to those objectives at the beginning of today's session, that we're thinking, how has your level of confidence maybe changed? Or are there new ideas that you've been able to experience throughout the workshop? And we can definitely bring up that next slide. I love to be able to showcase and you can link to the URL there or even scan the QR code to connect to Project Learning Trees Network across the US and internationally. The network provides hands-on professional development, to help classroom and non-formal educators so that they can confidently teach outdoors. There are a great support system for adapting activities to place-based approaches. This network does so much. And so I really encourage you and invite you to contact your PLT state coordinator for local resources and assistance, ideas for incorporating nature into your classroom and programs, and that connection to a network of professionals and support. All right, so we did mention that if you held on right till the end with us, that we would go over some general tips for teaching anything outdoors, getting outdoors with your learning learners, and then we're going to have some time for a Q&A or even just a sharing session to hear what's worked for you, what have you tried or some of those lessons learned. And so to help kind of get us started, I love these kind of 10 things to keep in mind. 
So really to know your site. Before going outside with learners, we encourage you to get to know your area's outdoor spaces, consider what activities they might support, if there are any hazards like broken glass, you know, removing them or contacting the right people to help remove them before you go outside. Then establishing norms, having learners identify rules for outdoor learning time that they can all agree to, reminding them that this is not recess. Of course, ensuring the proper clothing is a great way to make sure that everyone is able to focus and learn. If it's a hot summer day, having sunscreen and hats, or if it's a cold, you know, winter lesson, making sure maybe that you have an extra uh, pair of gloves or hats or something warm with you. Um, I, there was a great tip shared last time, even kind of reduce writing outside in cold weather. You can make some observations, but then instead of having to go through the hassle of taking all those gloves and mittens off uh, to go inside and make your recording. And so then really kind of start small. If learners are not used to working outside, we saw some of those, you know, bugs or it's too hot or it might be uncomfortable outside um, to think about how you could move outside for small activities, even spreading out blankets or sheets for sitting and having learn learners do a hands on activity um, that maybe you could also do inside. Using the environment is a great way to get learners comfortable with working outside. So you can use flowers and leaves to show radial and bilateral symmetry or measuring the height and circumference of trees, looking for patterns in the collection of seed pods or other natural objects, even learning about time and observing and recording growth or seasonal changes over time. It really helps to inspire problem solving. You can use questioning to focus learners' explorations, like which tree is furthest from our classroom or how much water do you think is in this puddle? It helps them make those connections to both measuring and then that kind of, um, you know, what's natural and how to make those observations when they're outside. Encouraging journals is a great way to record measurements, make observations and see those changes throughout the time that you're exploring together. You can capitalize on the unexpected with teachable moments when you come across something that maybe, you know, you weren't sure um, what it is or kind of explore that curiosity. Having a backpack with you with tools like rulers, tape measures, thermometers is always a great way to go. Even having some field guides to keep the conversation going. And then of course, to keep doing it. Don't be encouraged if things don't go perfectly. You don't need to have all the answers. And so hopefully with wrapping up with that, we do have some answers for you. And so we would love to see in the chat if you have any questions for us, or you could always go down to that um, reactions and raise hand um, motion if you'd like to come on microphone or camera to ask your question or share something that you've learned along the way with teaching outdoors. I and have I to say, oh, I have to say, I've been loving watching the chat. And I, I was just curious, um, not to put her on the spot, but Kristen, you had a great idea of using the pollinator activity in a PE class. And I was wondering if you could talk to that. I think that is wonderful. Do you want to come on mic or on camera? Um, yeah, um, for PE, I was trying to think of how I could, because I have 800 and something kids. So I was thinking about the materials, like what other materials I could use that would, uh, like, that could be reused over and over. I don't know, I was trying to think, I think I might use yarn balls and then try to find stuff that could be reused that would be in the containers instead of that sand that could fall everywhere. But I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I'm definitely gonna come up with something. I love that idea because there'll be, now you're incorporating, you know, movement. I mean, it is, but you could even make it a bigger thing and I give them more time to yeah. go, you know, on a field and have flowers running around, you know, and them going to collect, to pollinate different flowers. So yeah, I do love that idea. Yeah. Just very quickly here, I'm just adding into the chat box, the link to the feedback survey. It only takes about two minutes to fill out. We always love to get feedback on what else you would like to see for potential future sessions 
with our three organizations collaborating here. So uh, we do invite you to fill that out. And those who do will be eligible for a free subscription, one year subscription to Green Teachers Magazine and Resource Portal. And I was just looking through the chat again, and Karen, I love what you were saying about comparing the different textures of things in nature. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I think that's like spot on. Okay, is that better? We can definitely hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Anyway, I think uh, a lot of kids are um, just really into texture and feeling things. So I like to provide that for them. Yeah, uh, like a tissue box. When they run out in the classroom, it already has that hole for the hand and they, they can't see what's in it. So then you can change it with something soft or scratchy, you know, or bumpy. Yeah. So I really like the texture thing. Yeah, definitely engaging those different kind of sensory explorations is a way, great way to go. And I am also looking at Tammy's question for kind of tips for teen engagement. And I don't know, I always think of almost like, you know, the mystery items in a box being a great tool, even for older audiences. Sometimes they can make one in small groups and kind of then get their friends all riled up about what they might be guessing inside that sensory box. Um, and definitely the, some of those design thinking challenges are a great way to like ask them to build something that moves in a certain way and apply those skills and even kind of prototyping um, often is a great technique for older learners too. But I'd love to hear from our audience and our other educators if they have other tips for, for older learners too. And I love this one tip from Kathy about spending more time outdoors yourself so you feel comfortable and the kids will feed off of that. That is totally spot on. All right. I know we just have one more minute together. So I'd love to just quickly share how you can stay in touch with us um, as we really want to make sure that we continue to learn from you and with you by connecting to us on social. And please, if you're going out and doing some of these explorations, tag hashtag project learning tree um, if you have questions that's a great way of letting us know you can also find um, cyber chase on facebook and twitter and definitely if you're looking forward to more tips and tricks and engaging audiences um, i'd love to see you join us for our august 2nd cyber chase and plt uh, workshop that's actually a family webinar for children's ages kind of six to eight we're going to be kind of getting our hands on with some crafts and activities and so follow us on social media keep an eye out for that registration info or share it with your students we'd love to see you and your families there just wanted to respond i'm seeing some great suggestions in the chat here and melissa i love the idea of including teens in the process of selecting outdoor location and activities to boost their enthusiasm Enthusiasm. One thing we found, some of our stations, even though the cyber, cyber chase is geared for kids five to eight, we've had other stations that have included older kids um, and they've created their own videos to help teach younger kids about the topic. So if you engage the older kids kind of as teachers and helping to like do the activity with younger kids, that's a fun way to mo motivate them as well. Well, that brings us to the top of the hour. Thank you so much, everybody, especially in the middle of the summer or whatever part of the summer it is. <laughs> If it's especially if it's a nice sunny day where you are based, we really appreciate you joining us here for this session. And a big thanks to Project Learning Tree and Cyber Chase for presenting this, sharing your stories, your inspiration, your resources, your activities, and insights. So, regardless of what time it is where you are, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. The recording of this will be up at the end of the week, and we will also send a follow up email with resources at the end of the week. So be well.